BBC Radio 3, now it's just after half past ten, and time for this week's Between the Ears, the Book of Disquiet. Portugal's most famous poet, Fernando Pessoa, lived from 1888 to 1935. He was a prolific writer, not content with writing under just his own name, he dreamed up approximately 75 others. He didn't call them pseudonyms because he felt that didn't capture their true independent intellectual life. Instead, he called them heteronyms. These imaginary figures sometimes held unpopular or extreme views, some of which you'll hear in the programme. There was one semi-heteronym, Bernardo Suarez, and as Pessoa said, his personality does not differ from my own, but is a mere mutilation of it. Suarez is a grey man, almost totally nondescript, and is the author of the Book of Disquiet. In Between the Ears, Matt Thompson travels to Lisbon to meet our cast, Pessoa's niece, Manuela Nogueira, and his translator, Richard Zenith. Kind of a, a short poem that's um, written on stationery. Dizem, esquecem. Não dizem, disseram. Did they say that? Uh, or do they speak? They forget it. Did they not speak? They did speak. Por que esperar? Tudo é sonhar. Which translates as, uh, why expect anything? Everything is just dreams. Dreaming is always better than the real thing, because in dreams, everything is perfect. We're not going to realize our dreams anyway. This is all just, just dreaming. We are in Lisbon, and I'm the niece of Fernando Pessoa. I'm, I'm a survivor. survivor. I, I was, was 10, 10 years old, old when, when he died. died. And as everybody knows, children never, never forget. Oh, this is a photograph from a studio and he's dressed up as a, a sailor and so he was very well combed he was a, a dear person and he's not at all like the poet that everybody knows oh. he had a lot of sense of humor we all have futurist moments as when for example we trip on a stone richard senev is an American who, from a young age, was fascinated by foreign languages. Foreign languages. And that Fancy. seemed to him magic in a way. Then one thing led to another. He came to Portugal. The world of Fernando Pessoa is, is a bit like a black hole. And Richard Senef, <laughs> as others. Sorry about this. The manuscripts, they never end. Uh, they're new, new heteronyms, actually, that keep cropping up. It's hard, hard to escape, hard not to come under the spell of Pessoa. I am Richard, Richard Zenith. that house, which it had a corridor, he was sometimes walking backwards and forwards in that corridor with dark trousers, a white shirt, and with his hands on his back, and his head slightly uh, dropping down, very smoothly. His movement, up and down, up and down that corridor, he was projecting, he was thinking, he was, uh, his brain was working through all that drama that was passing in his head. I mean, all those people that came and made the drama that he wrote. All these alter egos, these other names under which he wrote, were not just pseudonyms, but heteronyms, hetero, other, nim, name, but not just pseudonyms, because it wasn't just the name that was false. It was the whole personality. 
so they were actually uh, others liter uh, uh, other writers and Busawa invented for these characters biographies different points of view neither this work nor those to follow have anything to do with the man who writes them he writes as if he were being dictated to the human author of these books has no personality of his own whenever he feels a personality well up inside he quickly realizes that this new being though similar is distinct from him an intellectual son perhaps with inherited characteristics but also with differences that make him someone else that this quality in the writer is a manifestation of hysteria or of the so-called split personality is neither denied nor affirmed by the author of these books you get the sense that he was possessed by his heteronyms when he wrote pessoa was just just a cauldron of all the these voices of course all of us have conflicting parts in our personality or soul what it's as if pessoa turned himself inside out he turned into these distinct heteronyms so hetero they're, they're other but actually uh, they always go back to pessoa i doubt therefore i think he didn't really have a, a two set of a schedule so we're walking into the brasileira all these mirrors along the wall but, but he would sit around here at these marble tables uh, he was a good drinker he liked drinking wine he would drink The poet is a faker who's so good at his act he even fakes the pain of pain he feels in fact and those who read his words will feel in what he wrote neither of the pains he has but just the one they don't and so around its track this thing called the heart winds a little clockwork train to entertain our minds do you think he was a happy person friend of mine that used to ask always is he happy is she happy she wanted to know i always said happiness is nothing that we have is uh, happiness is just moments of life after writing what he wrote he should be very happy to be what he was i think so you 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 created something that you like that is happiness but happiness is not a state of being or not being mhm <laughs> it sounds like a rather long answer <laughs> yes 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 i know i know i know but i mean everybody that thinks really everybody that creates mm. is a complicated person and only simplicity makes you happier buy them cheap you can buy them cheap I don't remember my mother she died when i was 1 year old my distracted and callous sensibility comes from the lack of that warmth and from my useless longing after kisses i don't remember i'm artificial it was always against strange breasts that i woke up cuddled as if by proxy They told me later on that my mother was pretty and they say that when they told me I made no comment. Do you get the the feeling that Pesser was just trying to get through the day? No, I would not say that. I would say that Pesser was frenetic actually with uh, full of projects and activity writing bits here and bits there and and so he could never finish anything because he or not very much because he always had these new ideas biographical details of Pessoa's life are somewhat obscure he didn't sit still the title the book of disquiet the word in portuguese desassossego is not there's also an, another possible translation is restlessness Uh, <laughs> no. 
Only my ghostly and imaginary friends, only the conversations I have in my dreams are genuinely real and substantial, and in them intelligence gleams like an image in a mirror. This is anniversary book, birthday book, floral. It belonged to my grandmother. But here, what I was going to, ask, to show to you, about uh, one year ago, I had it in, in the house like I have many things, but I never went through all the pages. And once I began to, to open the book more carefully, and I discovered this writing. Here in this day, 11 July, he wrote Le, looks like a V, Le Chevalier de Pas. And um, Le Chevalier de Pas, it was perhaps the first uh, person that he invented to accompany him. Like an imaginary friend? Yes, um, exactly, imaginary friend. And how old was he when he wrote that, do you think? Oh, oh, he was very small, about five years old. It's the last death of Captain Nemo. Soon, I too will die. All of my childhood was deprived in that moment of any possibility of enduring. And the last words before dying were in English. He said, I do not know what tomorrow will bring. I still keep that paper. <laughs> This is what I have in my house. It's a trunk, it's a wooden trunk. He kept all his life this trunk because that's where he kept his works. He, a lot of things disappeared with no interest, but this trunk he always kept his writings. It's full of uh, brown paper envelopes and outside the brown paper envelopes he wrote what it was inside. Uh, plans, plans, plans all the time. He kept on making plans, plans, and 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 a, a bit disappointing. There's really nothing special about it. It's just a, a rather simple wooden trunk, not, uh, not a particularly good quality. I've never done anything but dream. This and this alone has been the meaning of my life. My worst sorrows have evaporated when I've opened the window on the street of my dreams and forgotten myself in what I saw there. All I asked of life is that it go on without my feeling it. All I demanded of love is that it never stop being a distant dream. I am still obsessed with creating a false world and will be until I die. No nostalgia hurts as much as nostalgia for things that never existed. When I weep over the corpse of my childhood life, this can't compare to the fervour of my trembling grief as I weep over the non-reality of my dreams, humble characters. This is the street in the Baisha where here there's this uh, carpen carpenter shop which in the Book of Disquiet, Bernard de Suarez, is a fictional writer, uh, works as a, a bookkeeper mentions uh, a carpenter on the other side of the street outside of the window where he works. So, um, yeah, so here there's a pretty traditional carpenter. Uh, looks like he's here making boxes, perhaps crates, you know, nailing away, uh, nothing too sophisticated. And, act and actually this corresponds to what Pessoa described in the, in the Book of Disquiet. It was really a crate maker. Really? Yeah. Bernard de Suarez lived in a fourth floor room, in a rented room, had this rather solitary existence. A rather nondescript street. Jean Seul de Melure, 
from France in 1950. Here, there are no normal people, just people who are doubly abnormal. People who are doubly inverted sexually, such that they're on their way back to normality. Illustrious men are much studied nowadays, and the considerable talents of various renowned writers have merited major monographs in recent years. But instead of discussing the literary part of the oeuvre, the studies concentrate more and more on determining the probable length of their penises. A certain gentleman was accused of not raping a two-month-old baby. He replied that he was thinking of doing something better than mere rape when he was arrested. He had no intention of committing an offense against decency. In one of his letters, he claims that he's not touchy, which is kind of proof that he was. <laughs> Tell me things straight if you don't want to publish my work. And in fact, he was obviously quite offended. I don't think that's, I don't think that's Pessoa, I think, or what is that? It doesn't look to me like Pessoa, I don't know. I can't say. Though I was a child, I could see that he was in an intense thinking, intense state of mind, that he was out of where he was. He was completely, um, completely... He wasn't there, really. No, he was not there, exactly. He was absent. He was absent. I think he was absent very frequently. Now I know that. One thing that's interesting is that the heteronyms critique each other, kind of a family dialogue between them. Alvaro de Campus. After 12 minutes of your play The Mariner, whose utter lack of meaning makes the sharpest of minds go dull and grow weary, one of the watching women says, with languid magic, only dreams last forever and are beautiful. Why are we still talking? Exactly what I wanted to ask those women. That entourage made him, accompanied him, and was, in a way, it was the public the, that he had not. Do you think you, if you were to have met him, you would, you would like him? I don't know. I did dream once that I uh, met Fasoa. I met him in a, I guess in a cafe. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Come on. Say. A cold silence. The sounds from the street seemed to be cut by a knife. Then there was a long, cosmically held breath, a kind of generalized dread. Silence blackened the darkness. All of a sudden, live steel. How human the metallic peal of the trams. How happy the landscape of simple rain falling on the street, resurrected from the chasm. Oh, Lisbon, my home. The Soa with the, this classic raincoat and hat and glasses, bow tie, uh, and walking. It's, you can see the restlessness in the photograph. I'm a keeper of sheep. The sheep are my thoughts, and each thought a sensation. I think with my eyes and my ears, and with my hands and feet, and with my nose and mouth. To think a flower is to see and smell it, and to eat a fruit is to know its meaning. That is why, on a hot day, when I enjoy it so much, I feel sad, and I lie down in the grass and close my warm eyes. Then I feel my whole body lying down in reality. I know the truth, 
and I'm happy. He loved very much his mother, and he was not, never, never drunk. Writing and art was in one way a retreat from life. You asked me earlier on if the life around him uh, enters a lot into his writing, and it does, but it's in a kind of superficial way. I mean, you have the, the streetcar in his writing, you have these different characters, that, but they're, they're characters that he sees from a distance. They're people he doesn't touch, who I mean, talks about, I don't know, a barber, you know, who enters into his writing, tobacco shop, and, and, and these kind of cameo vignettes. But what you don't get in his writing is the psychological depth um, or, or emotional um, connection with other people. If he's not very good in the intimate aspects of life, that's quite a big part of life, isn't it? Yes, it's an enormous part of life. But there again, he has all these fictional friends. <laughs> Signor Antonio, you won't ever read this letter, and I'll probably never read over what I've written because I'm dying of TB. But I have to write you what I feel or I'll burst. I doubt you've ever given a second thought to the hunchback girl who lives on the second floor of the yellow building, but I never stop thinking about you. I know you have a girlfriend, that tall, pretty blonde... I envy her, but I'm not jealous, because I have no rights over you, not even the right to be jealous. I like you, because I like you, and I wish I were a different woman with a different body and a different personality, so that I could go down to the street and talk to you, because even if you didn't give me the time of day, I'd still love to meet you and talk. I'd like to talk to you just once, and then die. One morning, when you were on your way to the metalworks, a cat was scuffling with a dog across the street from my window, and we were all watching, and you stopped to watch too, and you suddenly looked up at my window and saw me laughing, and you laughed too. And that's the only time we were ever alone together, so to speak, or as alone together as I could ever hope for. Goodbye, Signor Antonio. I wish you all the happiness I'm able to wish, and I hope you'll never find out about me so as not to laugh, for I know I can't hope for more. I love you with all my heart and life. There, I said it. And I'm crying. Maria José Soa was certainly a lonely man. I think it was a structural kind of loneliness. Going back to when he was small, Pessoa was uh, possessed by a kind of demon of detachment. Talks about feeling a, a, a wall between him and, and the rest of the world, a wall or, or a glass, you know, something where he can can see people there's but but there's some 
something that separates him. Yeah. Uh, with Pessoa, it's 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 always so hard to know if uh, uh, what I don't know if it's possible to to divide what he really was or what he said and wrote that he was because he was always dictating who he was. Pessoa's detachment is, uh, it's not just that he's detached from the rest of the world or from other people, he's, he's entirely detached from himself, uh, which allows him to be this perfect spectator of Fernando Pessoa. Uh, I think that Pessoa uh, was always detached in his heart of hearts uh, from, from the youngest age, from when he wore a sailor suit. Each drop of rain is my failed life weeping in nature. Everything is dying in me, even the knowledge that I can dream. All of this heteronym business, all of that finally got old. And Pessoa, at the end of his life, perhaps because he sensed it was the end of his life, suddenly became very concerned to plunge into himself uh, as deep down as he could. That's when uh, the Book of Disquiet uh, enters its, uh, its greatest phase, and Pessoa, through this thin uh, disguise of Bernardo Suarez, really digs deep. Uh, that is when he becomes really shockingly honest and uh, and wants to wants to know who he is. I am in large measure the self same prose I write. I enroll myself in sentences and paragraphs. I punctuate myself. In my arranging and rearranging of images, I'm like a child using newspaper to dress up as a king. And in the way I create rhythm with a series of words, I'm like a lunatic adorning my hair with dried flowers that are still alive in my dreams. And above all, I'm calm. Like a rag doll that has become conscious of itself and occasionally shakes its head to make the tiny bell on top of its pointed cap ring. The jingling life of a dead man, a feeble notice to fate. I've made myself into the character of a book, a life one reads. Whatever I think is promptly put into words, mixed with images that undo it, cast into rhythms that are something else altogether. From so much self-revising, I've destroyed myself. From so much self-thinking, I'm now my thoughts and not I. I plumbed myself and dropped the plum. I spend my life wondering if I'm deep or not, with no remaining plum except my gaze that shows me blackly vivid in the mirror at the bottom of the well, my own face that observes me observing it. And what I want is to sleep. He had a very small mouth, that I remember, and a way of laughing very special. He had a sort of a restrained uh, laugh that fixes inside the mouth. Well, I think Pessoa's drinking, uh, which got heavier as he got older, suggests that uh, there was a, a profound dissatisfaction, that the, the control didn't, didn't, was, wasn't perfect. There was a price that to be was, paid, really, exactly, for they, the detachment. Exactly, yeah. He, he paid a, a price, most definitely. Yeah. Only later on, after he was dead, I began to understand that he was different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. At the time, I thought he was just like all uncles. A cup of coffee, a bit of tobacco whose aroma passes through me when I smoke it, my eyes half shut in a half dark room. This and my dreams 
are all I want from life. In Between the Ears, The Book of Disquiet, you heard the voice of Richard Zenith, who has translated Pessoa's poems and The Book of Disquiet into English. Also appearing was Manuela Nogueira, Pessoa's niece. All the voices were acted by David Holt. The Book of Disquiet was a Loftus production for BBC Radio 3, the producer Matt Thompson. This is BBC Radio 3, just after a minute past 11. Time for mixing it with Robert Sandal and Mark Russell.